All right, welcome to the Oz Stars Cars channel. I'm Glenn, and on today's fun project, we've got this C4 Corvette behind me. This is my 93 Corvette, and if you have this generation vet, which is from 1984 to 1996, uh, you may be interested in this video. We're going to talk about the cooling system and uh, some of the issues that these cars not really have. It's not really an issue, but something that might be problematic to you. So you're going down the road and you're looking at your temperature gauge now. The later Corvettes from like 91, I think it is, 90 and up have digital and analog gauges, but you're looking at that coolant temperature and it's probably, I don't know, you're going 60, 70 miles an hour. It's 70, 80, 90 degrees outside. And you look down, it's 220 degrees. And you're getting scared because you know 212 is boiling. And in most cars, you know, what are you going to be? Like 190, uh, you know, 200 maybe. So you're getting nervous. You could stop in traffic. You could be up to 235 degrees. And you're thinking that's it it's going to blow this is the end of it but these cars especially the lt1 i shouldn't say cars but the engine so in 92 to 96 corvette had the lt1 engine in there they also had the lt4 which is very similar to this and then of course the zr1s had the uh, massive lt5 which is you know a breed on its own but today we're going to talk about this one here with the lt1 and I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks and some knowledge on what you can do to get those temperatures down. And they're fairly simple, fairly easy. Most people can do it at home without a problem. Um, and you'll be better educated knowing how the system works. So why don't I pop the hood? We'll start uh, looking at some things. I'll point some stuff out. We'll do some testing and some other things. I'll put the car up on the ramps and uh, we'll get to it. If you're going down the highway and you see like 235 degrees, you don't really need to panic, okay? 240 even. Uh, if you're stopped in traffic and you start seeing like 250, 260, shut the sucker down and find out what's going on, what the problem is. Now, some of the obvious things that can go wrong. Well, let me just discuss the radiator here for a second. The radiator radiator sits on an angle, okay? And that's going to be important in just a minute with what I'm going to tell you. Most cars, they sit vertically, right? Up, perfectly up and down. But um, you have that there. You have your coolant tank here, okay? This is the main tank. This is where you would fill your cooling system up. You have a reservoir, a coolant reservoir down there. And the difference here is this is where you would fill your coolant up. And that is sort of like the overflow tank. So what will happen is when the car or heats up or the engine heats up, coolant obviously things expand when they heat up will go in there the excess coolant and then when the car cools down it will through vacuum suck the coolant back up through this pipe there's a pipe right here that comes in they call it a pipe this is a hose there's a pipe here um, and then back into the system now something that's very important to note is if you're doing you know first thing you want to do is check your cooling okay let, let's start with that i don't want to jump the gun there's a lot to talk about here and I don't want to get you guys confused. So if you have any questions, just leave them in the comment section. But down here where it says coolant, so this is sort of, the car is cold now. This is sort of like a dipstick. So what you do is you pull this out and there's a cold, like a transmission sort of thing. And then there's a hot. So this one's down at the cold mark, which is perfect right there. You can see it's wet. But um, so that's something you want to check there. Make sure you have coolant in here, obviously. Now, when it's cold, you can pop this top. You can take this cover off and make sure that this tank is filled. But when you do a flush and you get that coolant out, you need to make sure right here in the thermostat. Let me show you. Now, here's your throttle body. This is just an air intake tube. See this right along here. Right down in here is your bleeder valve. This is a very important piece. It looks like a screw, you know slotted right there well what you do is as you're filling the system let's say it's cold you crack that open you pour your fluid in until you see fluid running out of there okay so that's going to get most of the air out so that's what a bleeder valve does and that's very important to bleed the system to you know have it work efficiently um 
what else could I say up here? This has a what's called a reverse cooling system, and coolant flows up here through the from the radiator. There's the upper radiator hoses where I'm pointing to the thermostat. You've got your water pump is right below it. Yeah, let's show that because we need to discuss that. So this funky looking aluminum thing here. Oops, trying to get try to get this balance. <laughs> the problem is this light is magnetic, but almost everything on this car is aluminum or fiberglass, so nothing sticks. All right, here we go. So right down here is your water pump. Now, what's very important is, of course, your water pump has to be working, you know, to keep cool. But what I want to mention is these cars have something called an OptiSpark. Now, the OptiSpark was GM's version of a distributor cap. OK, so there's electronics in there and that runs off the cam. So it's kind of like a, a timing setup and not sort of it is. And that throws the spark from, you know, the coils right here down to the opti and then distribute it out through the spark plug wires to the spark plug into the engine to the engine so what can happen with these cars and the 92 and 93 when i say cars i mean the lt1 the 92 to 93 are very susceptible to damage from coolant so if this pump leaks okay i can't get a better shot for you but if this pump happens to leak start leaking and weeping and dripping onto that Opti, you're going to have to replace it because it's pretty much going to corrode. Coolant gets right in and it's toast. Um, they can be troublesome. So, and you really don't want to replace it with a cheap aftermarket because you're most likely going to have problems. It's a bear to get to. You got to remove a lot of stuff to do it, to do the job. But keep that in mind. The 94, I mean, I'm sorry, the 95 and 96, they put a vent tube on it so it's less susceptible to moisture damage. Um, so that's something to keep, you know, keep in mind. And what else can I show you? Oh, right down here, well, we can't really see it from here, but on the right side, let me zoom out, down at the bottom is going to be your drain plug for the radiator. So make sure, you know, when you're doing that, you open it up down there. And the other thing you need to do to do this job correctly, and I'm talking the LT1 here, is there are knock sensors on the left and the right side underneath the car. We're not gonna go down there today, but they are below these uh, exhaust manifolds on each side. And you need to take those out. They unscrew, they thread out. So when you do your coolant flush, your coolant drain, you wanna remove those, okay? Get as much crud out as you can. So if you're having problems keeping your car cool, you definitely wanna start with a clean cooling system. Uh, what else could we talk about here? Let me see. Oh, let me let me talk to you guys about um, temperatures. This this is very important. So people always say like, oh, my, when should my thermos or my fans come on? So let's go on the other side and let's talk about the fans. And I get a lot of questions about this stuff, so I'm glad to help you guys out. And um, let's go down here. You got two fans, all right? You've got one right here, which I don't know if you guys can see anything or not. It's hard to look through this little viewfinder and tell. This is one fan here. That would be, we're on the driver's side now, okay? So that would be your primary. And then you've got a secondary fan, which is, let me zoom in, back right in there is your secondary. I'm gonna show you guys a way to test those to make sure they're coming on. So if you're running hot, that could definitely be a problem if one of your fans aren't working or both aren't working. Here are the fan relays located right here. You've got your primary and your secondary relays. They are the same. So if you do have a problem with one or the other and you think it's the relay, you can just swap them and see if that fixes your problem. But I'm going to show you how to jump that to get that fired up with the car not running so you can, you know, listen and look and see and all that good stuff if it is properly uh, functioning. So that's important. And what I want to tell you guys about is on the, as far as when these fans should kick on, your fans should come on at 226 degrees Fahrenheit. Now on these 90 and up uh, models, they have digital and analog gauges, okay? Go with the digital. The analogs are not that accurate. You could hook up a scan tool, that would be the best way. 
Uh, a lot of people don't have a scan tool to do that. You know, fancy computer to tell you what, what the actual temperature sensor seeing, but the coolant temperature is 226 when it comes on, that would be your primary, and then it will shut off at 217. So as soon as the car starts going down to 217, the fans will kick off. Now, if you're going down the highway, you should be running, like I said earlier, about 198-202. Your fan shouldn't need to be on. Um, I mean, that's going to be hard to tell when you're going down the road. But trust me, they, they, if you're 217, it's still running too hot. Now, the uh, secondary fan should come on at 200. Now, if, let's say you're stopped at a stoplight, and now your temperature is going up to 234 degrees. Well, that secondary fan is going to kick on, or it should kick on, okay? And then it shuts off at 230. So as the temperature goes up, it kicks on. And I'd say about nine degrees is what the service manual says. I have the factory service manual for this particular vehicle. Um, they say about nine degree drop and the fan should come off. So fan, primary fan on at 226, off at 217. Secondary fan on at 234, off around 230. I mean, give it, give her, give or take a degree or two, right? So that's something really um, important to know that your fans are working. Now, when you, if your AC, here's your air conditioning compressor. If your AC is functioning properly, let's say, now this has R12, so we can call it Freon. If you have a newer car, it's called refrigerant in there. Um, this is charged properly. When you turn on the AC unit, your fan should kick on, okay, immediately. If they don't, you either have low Freon or you got a problem with your fans, but. I'm going to show you now, we'll go in the car, and I'm going to jump the uh, connector with a paper clip. Let me show you that on paper because I probably can't film it under there, it's too tight. What I'm doing, and then we'll turn the key on and listen. I've got the service manual here, and I wanna show you a quick way how to diagnose your fans in case you don't think one's working or they're both not working or one or the other. Anyway, it's hard to see under the car, so I'm gonna show you in this, uh, diagram here. This is your DLC, Diagnostic Link Connector, and some people call it an ALDL, which is Assembly Line Diagnostic Link. But anyhow, it's a 12 pin. There's six pins across the top, six across the bottom, and they're labeled with letters, and we're interested in A and B. So we're going to jump these terminals with a paper clip, or you can use a piece of wire. This will put the car in, in diagnostic mode, so on your gauges up there you'll see you know it'll flash these different codes yellow light will flash and you have all these different types of codes but we're not even interested in that right now we're just interested in jumping a and b which will automatically fire up those fans as soon as we put the ignition on so let me go ahead and jump that i'll turn the ignition on and let's check it out the easiest way i found to reach the dlc is tilt the steering wheel up and put the seat, slide the seat as far back as you can. Well, here it is here. I'm gonna show you our paper clip. And hopefully you can see, let me come up here, right there. And you can see the two terminals I'm in, hopefully. Let's see, that's a good angle right there. So there you go. Now, once that's in, the uh, key's not on yet. It's not in the ignition. I'm gonna put it in there. And then all we need to do is turn this here. Let me get this on, okay. And what we'll do is visually, or, or not just visually, audibly, as soon as I turn the ignition on and the lights come on the dash, the fan should automatically kick on. So let's do that right now. I'm gonna turn this on and let's listen. And then we'll go over there and look at it. Okay, you can hear them running and we're in diagnostic mode anyway. So you'll see your service engine light will be flashing or should be flashing the code. In this case, it's gonna flash code 12 because we don't have any codes, which is a good thing. It's kind of loud. Hopefully you can hear me. Then you come over here and I can feel air coming out of this primary and then I hear the secondary over there running. I can kind of see now here. You can, but probably couldn't hurt a word when I said. Let me shut this thing. So at this point, turn your key off and your fan should go off. Okay. So that's the best way 
to check your fans. Obviously, make sure your battery's charged and you've got a good, strong battery. So, and then you just pull this right out. Boy, it's a lot easier to remove than put in. That's what she said. Okay, so you still with me so far? We've, uh, we know the components, we've checked the fans. Let's say that the coolant was low, we add coolant and then we get a mysterious coolant loss. So what you could do is, I have this tool here from Redline Detection. Um, this here is a pressure pump. So there's a little gauge right there. And according to service, information now this goes up to 30 psi you can see it right there on the right you want to put 15 to 20 pounds now the service manual calls for 20 uh i usually use like 15 to 18 i don't know i just think 20 20 is a lot of pressure so it could handle it but you attach this piece here we're not going to do it today but this piece right here and then all you do is after when i say attach with these adapters you open this up put that in there and then you pump this up okay this is just a pump right here I'm trying to do this one hand and I'm sorry if it's all like really messy here or sloppy so push down like this makes that nice noise what's that remind you of bad gas all right and what it's doing is putting pressure through this hose and into the system so what that does is if you have a leak and the engine's cold you know it's going to force that coolant out whether it's a leaky radiator a hose um, let's hope it's not a head gasket and by the way uh, speaking of head gaskets these engines these LT1s are made they can go the distance I mean their head gaskets are very durable the way this is designed they usually don't have head gasket failure even with very high temperatures so you can do a coolant test or pressure test I should say and now I want to take you below the car I'm going to put it up on ramps and I'm going to show you the primary cause it's like you know we need a drum roll for what causes this problem the most guys are wondering I'm using race ramps I like them they work really well worth the money check it out so like we talked about you're going down the road and maybe you're running about 215 220 degrees well here is uh, what you can do to probably eliminate that and I'm not saying that's gonna cure your problem but we come under the car and let me show you where the vacuum cleaner is on these Corvettes now C5s you know C6 C7 even they all have these uh, angled radiators and they can really get packed up now this one was cleaned out probably well i don't know five thousand miles ago or something so it's not too bad you might see a few bugs there let's let's scoot up sometimes you'll see let me uh when i say scoot up i mean zoom in so you can see some junk up in there and what i'm going to do is i'm going to pull some footage i have some older footage where i actually filmed the crap that's in here And we want to look for debris. There's a leaf. Let's look up top. Look at all this stuff here clogging up the condenser. All that. It's like grass or something. And then what I saw here, look at this. There's a uh, plastic bag. So all this stuff will cause your C4 to run hot. Then if we look back where the radiator is there's a bunch of stuff there let's get that I mean it's just clogged and there's a whole bunch of small pebbles where the main problem lies with these cars is right in here now I have some footage that I'm gonna 
cut into this video here that I filmed a while back and you'll see what's going on but I want to show you now because that footage I reviewed it it didn't look that clear so um, right back here you can see some black stuff like right there that's towards the driver side and it's kind of round shaped well that's because that's where the primary fan is and that's sucking in a lot of debris there's the back of the condenser so even though you have that condenser in front of the radiator it's still drawing a lot of crap in Look at all that junk in there. Looks like a bird nest. There's more stuff in the back. But anyway, you get a good idea. You need to make sure that that's cleared out. The point is you see all that crap that's in there. There's plastic bags, leaves, bugs, grass, cigarette butts, rocks, all kinds of stuff. The best, the two best ways to clean this out without having to take it all apart, and you could do that if you're doing service on it, you might as well do it then, but if you're not going to, and you wanna do it like the cheap and dirty way, and it works, trust me, uh, it's compressed air, and if even if you don't have the compressed air, to use the hose and to be patient and really try to flush it from the engine side out through the front. So what I'm gonna do now is let's get the car outside and uh, we'll get the hose fired up and I'll show you, I'll demonstrate that for you. All right, so you get your garden hose and put your swimsuit on and uh, get to work. So I take the smallest nozzle I can find and just get down in here where the fan is and start to spray right behind the fan. So I'm pushing that garbage out. You know, this is after you've done, uh, hopefully you have compressed air to get the excess out. And you wanna do that over here and then sneak in and do the, uh, well, we talked about the secondary fan. So the one on the passenger side. And just flush that real good. And it wouldn't hurt to do this, I mean, you know, every now and then. Even if you don't think it's too bad, just to get the dirt out. And then get under the car, you know, when it's up on the ramps, and go ahead and hose it out that way also, obviously. So I would do that afterwards, just trying to push all that crap out. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what to do there. All right, so let's wrap this video up. There's something really important, and I hope you've uh, stayed this long to hear about it. As far as the coolant, what type of coolant? We talked a lot about antifreeze today, but not what kind, because there's so many different flavors out there, right? And I don't just mean the brand names, the colors, and all that other good stuff. Well, here's the deal. If you've got an 84 to a late 95, mid-year 95, and you have the green coolant in there, you open that up, you see it's green coolant or yellowish green, definitely use the green stuff, okay? 50-50 uh, mix, always make sure there's you're using distilled water if you mix it yourself, or you brought buy it pre-mixed, it's gonna be like that. You don't have to worry about it. Now, something very important, if you have a late 95 and a 96 model, okay, the last year for the C4, you want to use Dexcool, and that's that orange stuff, it's like orange, turns pink a little bit, uh, that's what you need to use. If you put your green stuff in with the pink stuff or orange, you're going to get a nasty slime sludge is what you're going to create, and that's not good for your cooling system, it's going to clog things up. So. Keep that in mind, uh, say what you want, but that's what the factory service manual says. You know, that's how it goes. Dex cool in the 96s. These cars also, or GM used to recommend or suggest these tablets. I, I have some laying around somewhere from like 1993, um, you know, working on cars all these years. GM used to put these little tablets. They look like Alka-Seltzer tablets in there. And they want you to put five or six of them in the system. Basically, it was a stop leak. Uh, stop leak's just going to clog up your radiator and everything else. It, don't use that. There was a TSB put out by General Motors. I, I, Sorry, I don't know the TSB off the top of my head at the moment, but it's out there. To discontinue use of that, that was to uh, cure like small leaks and stuff, I guess. I, I don't know. It was put in at the factory, I believe. But... We're not using that stuff today, so don't worry about that. Now, if you have a leak and I, see, you know, you visually can see it, repair it. Use the pressure tester if you can't to find it. I suggest you fix the leak and don't try to just stop up and clog the leak. Okay, but that's up to you. You do what you want. Hey, it's your car, right? 
So uh, other than that, I hope I've given you a, enough information today. I have no idea how long this video is. All I know is it seemed like all day to film. So I hope you appreciate it. Uh, I certainly appreciate you being here with me today. Uh, check out my other videos here on YouTube. I've got a lot of repair videos. I've got a bunch of popular Corvette videos. And other than that, smash the like button, please. That helps my channel. And uh, that's about it. So I'll see you on the next one. Take it easy.